Hi guys, can I get some responses? Can you all hear me? Okay, fantastic. So hello everyone. Welcome to our live session on studying abroad and preparing a statement of purpose. I am Neha Agrawal. I'm an academic communication expert and founder of Wise Up Communications. And I'm going to be your facilitator for this session. So before we start, let me share a little something about myself so you can know me better. Like most of you here, I am also an engineer by degree and I completed my undergrad from RV College of Engineering, Bangalore. Soon after that, I went on to pursue my master's from Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. And I also worked at ExxonMobil Chemical in Singapore as a materials engineer. So while I was studying at NTU, I got this amazing opportunity to coach over 120 students from 15 different countries in improving their written and oral communication skills. And that's when I realized that this barrier to good communication skills also existed back at home. Even when I was working at ExxonMobil, I realized that communication skills played a very important role there as well whether it was meeting discussions, knowledge sharing sessions, or technical presentations. Communication skills were a way to show your technical expertise in a subject. And if you couldn't communicate well, people often thought that you did not have enough technical knowledge. So that's when I decided to come back to India and start Wise Up so that I can help students in improving their communication skills so they too can have very successful and meaningful careers. Writing a statement of purpose and personal statement is very important when you are planning a career abroad because these things decide which university that you land into. So without further delay, let's see the agenda that we have for today. So the first thing that we're going to do is understand your research goals. I want to see how much, what's your career goals and what exactly do you want to do when you plan your studies abroad? Then we're going to understand how to finalize universities. So I'm going to share with you the step-by-step -step process that you're supposed to follow in order to choose your universities for studying abroad. Then we will move on to the next part, which is starting the application process. And here I'm going to share with you all the things that happens when you send out your applications. What are some of the things you need to pay attention to for your applications? Everything we'll be covering. Then we will be talking in detail about SOPs and personal statements. How are you supposed to write them? What is the difference between these two documents? We'll be covering these things. Then I'll share with you the deliverables of a course on, on uh, studying abroad. Well, I'll be sharing how to write a statement of purpose, personal statement, LORs, and even emails to professors. So essentially, all the documents where you need written communication skills we'll be covering in our course. And finally, hopefully after sharing all this information, you will be well prepared to go and win your next career milestone. So let's begin guys. The first thing that I have here is understanding your career goals. And for that, I'll conduct a live polling session right now. It's completely anonymous. So do participate without any inhibitions. All you need to do is either scan the QR code that you can see or log in through the web. I will also share the link with you here in the chat box and then we will see the live results together. Okay, so I want this to be a very interactive session and not a boring one-sided lecture, all right? So do participate with me. And I'm sharing the link here in the chat box, one second. Yes, so you can log in using this link. And let me know when you are done and then we'll move to the questions then, okay? So the first question that I have for you here is why do you want to study abroad? And let's see your responses. Okay. So some people are saying better job opportunities. 62% people, okay. The only two answers that I have here. 63% people are saying better job opportunities and another 36% people are telling me better research facilities. 4% people, I think probably one person is telling me I just want to get out of India. 
<laughs> okay nobody is going through peer pressure i hope that's good i think believe it or not guys sometimes our decisions are influenced by peer pressure and we don't even realize it so that's actually the truth all right thank you and now moving on to the next question which is what is your end goal after studying abroad so what do you want to do after you study abroad what's your plan get a job and settle abroad get international work experience 3 to 5 years then come back to india come back immediately after finishing studies and i'm not sure yet i mean that that's also fine if you're not sure okay so much wow that's that's fantastic actually that's nice to know that 50% of you are telling me get international work experience and then come back generally that not that doesn't happen and people actually change once they go abroad another 28% are saying i want to get a job and settle abroad all right another 13% come back immediately after i finish studies and 9% not sure which is again completely all right okay moving on to the next final question that i have for you which is which countries are you applying to usa singapore so which is the main country that you think you want to study in so probably that is something you can mention here usa singapore germany uk and europe canada other countries like australia japan <clears throat> all right so very very expected results actually 55% of you are telling me usa another 18% interested in germany and then 15% in uk europe and then few in canada and very few in other countries as well okay can i know in the chat box which other countries are you guys interested in ukraine okay not a good time to go to ukraine australia all right okay so thank you thanks for participating in the poll guys and thanks for sharing your responses and now coming to the next part that we have here which is how to choose universities so we're going to break this down into three stages i think in order to finalize your universities there's a lot of decision making which is involved right and we're going to break it down so that you can take these decisions accordingly so the first question you need to ask yourself is masters or phd which degree do you want to pursue so have you decided on this yet like are you very clear about this or are you confused who wants to go for masters here who wants to go for phd who is confused i know i was very confused when i was trying to apply for my masters and uh, i mean studying abroad masters mostly okay <laughs> masters masters for sure all right phd masters confused right okay so many of you are telling me that yes you do want to go for a masters program all right so very few into phd program as well okay <clears throat> that's nice all right so guys what just happened sorry guys i don't know what just happened one second yes i hope you all can see my screen now sorry for that yes so in order to decide between a masters or a phd there are certain things you need to consider and let's see what they are first is your career goals so you need to think about what exactly do you want to do after you get that post graduate degree are you somebody who is interested in academia you want to become a professor an academician move forward in in that direction or are you somebody who sees yourself as like a research scientist where you probably want to work in a big company but in the r and d department if these are some of your career goals then phd is definitely the right choice you should definitely go and pursue a phd but as majority of you told me that why you want to study abroad is for better job opportunities then i think both masters and phd can get you that and i'll share different scenarios of what happens sometimes firstly what happens is that uh, <coughs> sorry about that firstly what happens is that say you want to apply for a normal job and you know in a lot of companies there are job positions which are just slightly above the undergraduate level 
so if you feel that you know let me just get the highest degree which is a phd and after that i can get all the jobs it doesn't work like that sometimes when you apply to these kind of jobs which are just slightly higher up than the undergrad level they actually send you back and tell you that listen you're overqualified for the position and we don't think we'll be able to hire you on the other hand what happens is that say you join a company and then after that you feel that you know you want to get in in the r&d direction where you want to become a scientist and you want to work there then again the company sometimes comes to you and tells you that listen you need a minimum phd degree for that so which is why i am saying that be very clear about your career goals and what exactly do you want in your career and then you can choose whether you want to go for masters or phd but obviously apart from career goals there are other things you need to consider and the first one is finances so when you're going for a masters degree abroad the duration of the degree is roughly between one and a half to two years and on an average a masters degree is very money intensive and on an average you'll be spending somewhere be somewhere between 25 to 30 lakhs minimum on your tuition fees and it can be obviously slightly higher as well if you include the living expenses so this cost is like without scholarship so that is why masters programs are generally very expensive and you need to you know it's, it's a lot of investment that goes in when you're going for a masters program on the other hand phd programs generally come with scholarships where your tuition fees are completely waived off and apart from that you also get stipend like almost $2000 per month which easily covers your living expenses so if you see that way while masters involves a lot of money phd degree you will get almost for free in fact at the end of the day i think you'll end up saving some money as well but on the flip side the problem is that a phd degree is more time in time intensive so a phd requires somewhere between 4 to 5 years to complete and apart from that it's not a very easy degree to get right you need a lot of hard work commitment motivation to be able to get that phd degree on the other hand a masters degree is shorter somewhere between one and a half to two years and even though it might be challenging you will sail through so that's the guarantee that comes with a masters program so based on all these things what is your commitment level how much money can you put in in a foreign degree and what are your career goals decide between a masters and a phd all right coming to the next part once you have done that we will come to the countries where you should study in now different countries offer different environments for you to study and what do i mean by that first is job opportunities now just because you're studying abroad that doesn't mean every country will be able to get you a job in any field that you are going to different countries have different types of job opportunities take the example of us so us as most of you want to go there us is known for its silicon valley so the tech jobs there are many like many many tech jobs are available in the us so if whether you are studying in a mediocre university in the us whether university of southern california or university of florida arizona state university or you are studying in a very good university like columbia georgia tech you will easily get a job in you will easily get a job in the us when it comes to the tech field and by tech field i mean computer science it electrical electronics all these people they are easily able to get a job on the other hand when it comes to core engineering fields like civil engineering chemical engineering mechanical engineering sometimes even if you are graduating from some of the top universities it's difficult to get a job in us you can definitely grow in the research area and continue your start continue your work in the university but if you want to get job in the industry then that is where it gets challenging on the other hand countries like germany canada other countries in europe it's very easy to find a job for core engineering fields because they have a lot of automobile industry chemical industries so it's easier to get a job there so based on which field you come from decide which country is more suitable for you and then apply accordingly next thing you should consider when choosing countries is scholarships so based on how much money can you shell out for your higher studies you also need to consider the option of scholarships now when it comes to us there are hardly scholarships available for masters program most of the universities in the us are literally gold diggers and the amount of money that you need to put in to study in the us is increasing year on year 
So forget scholarships if you want to do a master's in the US. Obviously, as I told you, PhD degrees do come with scholarships, whether you're going to any of the country. So even if you're going to the US for a PhD, you will have that option of, you know, scholarship and uh, stipend and all those things, okay? But coming to scholarships for Germany and other countries in the Europe, it's much better. Firstly, countries like Germany, there are no tuition fees for a master's program because these countries, they really want to encourage people to do a post-grad degree, which is why they almost have zero tuition fees. Uh, living expenses are obviously slightly on the higher side and this is where the scholarships come in. So if you are able to secure a scholarship, which is again slightly easier to get, then your living expenses are also taken care of. So if you're doing a master's program in Germany, it will come almost for free. And obviously in Germany as well, job opportunities are brilliant, whether you're coming from a tech field or you're coming from a core engineering field. So again, do your research properly. When I was studying in my college in Bangalore, the thing was that most people were fixated about the US. So even I did not, because my entire peer group was like that, where everybody was trying to apply to the US, I never even considered other countries like Germany. So please keep your eyes and ears open, research enough about these countries and then apply. And finally, coming to tuition costs. So as I told you, for countries like Germany, you have almost zero tuition fees. Coming to uh, US, the tuition fees are somewhere one of the highest that you can have in the world, somewhere between nowadays 30 to 35 lakhs can be even more. When it comes to Singapore, for that matter, tuition fee is slightly lesser almost 60 to 70 percent of that of the U.S. So if you're spending 30 to 35 lakhs um, in, in the U.S., you will finish your education probably 20 to 25 lakhs in Singapore. So that's the difference. All right. So based on all these parameters, based on all these criteria, choose which countries you would like to apply to. And finally, coming to how to choose universities. So once you've decided whether you want to go for a master's or a PhD, and once you've decided which countries you would like to apply to, the next topic is choosing the universities. So what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to first look at the programs carefully. If you're going for a PhD, well, that PhD program, program doesn't have a lot of variations as such. But when it comes to a master's program, nowadays what universities have done is that they've launched many master's programs, some of them just to make money. So you have master's programs like Master of Science, Master of Engineering, Professional Masters. So please read these programs carefully and what they have to offer. Something I would like to warn you about is not go for a nine month master's program. What happens in this nine month? See, one of the reasons why you want to study abroad is to gain some international exposure, actually learn something from that degree and then get a good job there, correct? So when you're going for a nine months program, first two, three months or probably three to four months goes in settling in the new country. And by the time you settle down, you realize that your program is almost over. And because you're going for such a short duration, the entire study um, curriculum is completely packed. You don't have breathing space and you don't have enough time to even look for a job. And forget mingling with other people and exploring that international culture. All these things, they don't happen in a nine-month program. On the other hand, if you're going for a one and a half to two year program, that is much better because you get enough time to settle down. You get to learn all the different, uh, I mean, you get to learn properly whatever program that you're going for, get some knowledge. And then what happens, a lot of my friends, they did that was when you're going for a slightly longer program, you can actually first apply for an internship. Do an internship there, slightly easier to get also. And then after that, getting a full-time job becomes easier. In fact, sometimes the companies you did your internship in, they offer you a full-time job. So that way, uh, one and a half years to two years program are much better. In fact, if you think that nine months program is going to be cheaper as compared to a one and a half to two year program, it's not like that. It's almost the same cost. The reason why they have launched it is because it's easier to get in. So a lot of people feel, oh my God, I've gotten into Cornell. Oh my God, I've gotten into Columbia. But at the end of the day, it's just like a money-making scheme and you actually don't get much out of the degree. Next is looking at research areas. So if you're going for a research-based master's or if you're going for a PhD program, it's very important to carefully see what are some of the research areas that those universities have to offer and then decide whether you want to study in that university or not. 
for at this level it's good to send out emails to the professors as well and check with them if they have any openings in their research groups especially if you're going for a phd program it's for a four to five year duration and a lot depends on the supervisor that you are working with so it's important to know as much information about what you're getting yourself into and finally categorizing the universities so once you have a, once you have a general understanding of which type of universities you would like to apply to what you need to do is categorize your universities so say for example you are applying to nine universities then you need to break them down into three categories first category is ambitious next is moderate and third is safe how many of you actually know about these categories i'm sure some of you must know about this right so what is the ambitious category here yeah. so ambitious category is where you choose universities which are very difficult to get in but they are like your dream universities and if you do get into them nothing like it yeah so at least there should be two to three universities where you should apply because what if you know some miracle happens and you do get into these universities nothing like it then the second category is moderate universities here um these universities are also very good and your chances to get in would also be moderate probably yes probably no somewhere around that so it's definitely good to try to these you know try applying to these universities and finally the last category is safe universities so these are universities which you are 100% confident that if you apply to you will get an admission and you don't mind studying in these universities if at the end of the day these are your only options left so then break it down into these three categories and then apply to these universities accordingly all right so guys i hope this part is clear and i hope you've learned something from this can i get a thumbs up if you did like what i've shared till now so good so far so good okay <laughs> fantastic thank you all right so now coming to the next part which is starting the application process so i actually want to know from you guys how many of you are actually going for fall 2023 admissions from here anybody trying for fall 2023 planning oh many of you nice then this is going to be super super useful fall 2024 that's good too early planning is good <laughs> all right so the first thing you guys need to do is check application requirements carefully i think guys this is the time when you start when you need to start working on working in this direction if you are planning for your fall 2023 admissions not we are just entering april and in april at least what you should do is start looking at universities where you are interested to study in so check the application requirements carefully what do they need entrance test in terms of gre gmat toefl ilts cgpa cutoffs if they have any generally they don't have they don't explicitly share cgpa cutoffs but sometimes they give you like a percentile or sometimes they tell you first class with distinction first class with honors that's the minimum that we need um then after that obviously we come to sops personal statements and lors these are very important documents sops and personal statements are something that are i mean sops are something that 99% of the universities are going to ask you personal statements sometimes universities ask you to send along with an sop sometimes they don't sop is also called as letter of motivation in europe and in germany but essentially they mean one and the same thing so start working towards your sop also then coming to your lors so generally colleges need three lors okay and it's your choice whom you want to take your lors from sometimes two but most universities need three lors then if you are going for research based programs sometimes they also ask you to submit a research proposal and then obviously look at the deadlines of all these universities as well and what's the last day to apply what i've realized is that most universities their websites are little confusing where you really have to hunt here and there for information so what you should do is that once you've decided which universities you want to apply to create an excel sheet list down all your universities there make separate columns and write down all their requirements once you do that 
you will not have to go again and again on the website to check that same information and you will save a lot of time. And again, you will have everything at one place. Once you know, okay, what is the GRE score they need? What is the TOEFL or IELTS scores they need? Accordingly, you can prepare yourself. Sometimes what happens is that we don't even know what we are aiming for. And then we end up with like a 315 out of 340 in GRE or 318 out of 340 in GRE. And then once you start applying, you realize, oh, all the universities I want to apply to, their cutoff is 320. So which is why it's important to do all this research beforehand, You even before you give all these admission tests. Next, coming to sending emails to professors in advance. Now, I think this is again something that confuses a lot of people. Should I send emails to professors? Should I not send emails to professors? What am I supposed to do? So let's get this understanding very, very clear. If you are going for coursework-based programs, what are coursework-based programs? Coursework-based programs are those where you only have to study the subjects, pass the subject, and then you graduate. Okay, so most of the Master of Science programs in the US, they are coursework based program where there is no research component. If there is no research component, then emailing the professor in advance is not going to help because the professor has no role to play in your admission process. But if you are going for research based programs where you have to have a research thesis, either for your master's or for your PhD, in that case, you email the professors. So you email the professors to check with them whether they have any openings in their research group. Sometimes what happens is that the professor really likes your profile, what you have done, and they do have an opening in their research group. Then they uh, agree to take you in. And then they actually call up the admissions committee and tell them that, listen, can you evaluate this person's profile and uh, see if everything is fine, then I would actually like to take them in. But obviously, when you're sending out emails to professors also, you can't be sending spam emails or bulk emails. They don't work. You need to tailor the email, customize the email for each and every professor. So when I was applying for my master's almost uh, five to six years ago, I was applying to total 10 universities. And from each university, I chose five professors. And for each professor, I wrote a customized email. I mentioned, I read some of their papers, one or two papers, and I mentioned what did I like about their work? What did I like about their paper? If I had any good questions to ask them about their research, I did that. I specifically shared that these are some of the things he's working on, which I am interested in. And when professors also see that you've written such a tailored email for them, they do reply to you. So out of what, 50, 50 emails that I had sent, five professors did reply to me. And out of them, two decided to take me in. One was my NTU professor under whom I finally did my thesis. Uh, and then another one was my professor. Another one was a professor at Georgia Tech. So both these professors agreed on email that, you know, we are ready to take you in. And immediately, one week to 10 days later, I got my admits from them. And so I realized that emailing the professors beforehand and if they do agree to take you in plays such an important role in getting admits, especially when you're going for research-based programs. But again, as I told you, for coursework-based programs, it doesn't add value. For coursework-based programs, once you have gotten an admission in the university and say you want to do like a TA or a RA under some of the professor, then you can email them and tell them that, Prof, I am joining the university in fall 2023. I've already got an admission. I would like to do TA or RA under your guidance. Uh, do you have any positions available for that? That is something you can do on a later, on a later stage, okay? Then coming to application review and shortlisting. So the total of two stages through which your application goes to once you have submitted, uh, submitted it, okay? First, what happens is that the admission committee reviews your application and they see whether you have fulfilled all the basic requirements, whether you've uploaded all the LORs or not, whether you've uploaded your SOP personal statement, your transcripts, your uh, scores, everything is there or not. If anything is missing, Either they will get back to you, they will get in touch with you and tell you that, see, your application is missing so-and-so thing, please complete your application. Otherwise, sometimes if it's too late, it gets rejected as well. Then once they see that, okay, all the requirements you have already fulfilled, then it goes to the next stage where they actually see everything. They look at your SOP, your personal statement, your scores, the work that you've done, your resume. And based on that, they evaluate your profile. And then... 
they actually compare you to the pool of candidates as well. So say, for example, your profile is very good. Your entire application that you've sent out is very good. And in general, you should have gotten an admission in that university. But that year, the pool of candidates who have applied are also brilliant. That generally doesn't happen. So probably among that pool of candidates, your profile doesn't stand a chance. So you can never know what is happening in the admissions committee and how are they making a decision because it's so subjective to what kind of applications also they are receiving. So when people come and tell me that, ma'am, can you please evaluate my profile? Ma'am, can you look at my scores and tell me whether I will get into this university or not? I keep telling them that, listen, you can't know whether you will get in it or not. You can obviously make an assumption based on past results. If your seniors have gotten into those universities and you have a similar profile as them, you can make some assumptions, but you can never be 100% sure. Okay. So don't get yourself too fixated about these profile evaluations and stuff. All right. So this is how the university application process takes place. Clear so far, guys? Are we good? Should I move to the next part? Yeah. Okay. I hope you're liking the session so far. We are almost halfway, halfway into our session. Hmm? Okay. All right. <laughs> Glad. Thank you so much. Your responses are really keeping me motivated. So thank you. Thanks a lot for that. Okay, so coming next to our topic, which is SOPs and personal statements. So as I told you earlier, SOPs and personal statements are very important documents when you are submitting your applications abroad. In fact, SOPs and personal statements, they also have a lot of weightage where they can actually make or break your application. I'll give you an example. Say you have a very good profile okay say your profile your scores transcripts work experience everything is very good and then if you submit a very good statement of purpose as well along with that it's like a cherry on the cake and it really boosts your chances of getting that admission on the other hand say for example your profile is slightly weak you have probably one or two backlogs you have like one year of career gap all these things you have and then you're worried whether you'll be able to get an admit or not in that case, if you write a very good statement of purpose, literally explaining all the reasons why you had a backlog, what happened, and obviously uh, strengthening all the other sections in an SOP as well, that brings you in the running to get an admission. From, from very high chances of you getting a reject, it still gets you into the running and probably you will get an admission. So that is what an SOP can do. That's the power of an SOP. So don't ignore these documents. I know I used to do that. I did not pay a lot of attention to these documents initially. So please don't ignore these documents. Pay equal attention to them as you are to other parts of the application. All right. So how are you supposed to write your statement of purpose? Let's understand. So the first step is brainstorming ideas. And I think this is the mistake that I made. When I had to write an SOP, I just sat down to write one. Don't do that first thing you're supposed to do is just brainstorm ideas about what are all the things from your career that can actually make a compelling SOP that you can include in your SOP. And some of the lines in which you can think about is, number one, why do I want this degree? Now, the most basic answer that you can think of is obviously I want a degree because I want good job opportunities abroad, right? I want to settle there. That's why I want this degree. But that's not the question here. The question is, why do you want this particular degree and not any other degree? Why are you motivated to pursue this particular program in this university and not anywhere else? So you need to share your motivation. Why are you so interested here to do this particular degree? That is something the admission committee wants to know. Then, how will my qualifications and experiences make me a good fit for the program? So when the admissions committee is looking at your SOP, they want to see what have you done in your career so far? Has your experiences till now prepared you to face any challenges that the graduate program has to offer? If you have those sufficient experiences, then they feel confident that yes, today if I give admission to this person, he will actually succeed in this program, pass in this program with flying colors and do something in his life. 
so that's the kind of guarantee that's the kind of understanding that they are looking for when they are reading your sop so think in those lines as well next what courses or program features excite me generally what happens is that when we are writing an sop we constantly talk about ourselves what are we interested in what we want to do at the same time it's important to appreciate the university and why are you interested to study in only that particular university so do proper research what are some of the courses that they are offering what are some of the facilities that are there in the university in terms of extra curricular sports cultural programs if you are interested in those and highlight that tell them because this shows that not only have you done enough research about the university but you are actually really interested in studying there and out of two candidates one who is not so interested and another one who is super interested i would obviously like to give admission to that person right so you need to share these things in an sop next one final is what do i want to do after i get this degree so in an sop you also need to share with the admissions committee what are your career goals your short term and your long term career goals once you get that post graduate degree because again they want to see that okay if you are if we are giving you admission in 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 our college in our university are you doing something worthwhile in your career and what are your career plans where do you see yourself because in the end they also care about their alumni base right and they obviously want their alumni to be uh, doing very well for themselves so if i mean when they look at your application and they when they look at somebody else's application who has no idea what he wants to do in his career and just the next immediate step is getting this degree they will obviously be less confident about that person so you need to share with them why do you want this degree and what are you going to do after it once you have brainstormed what you need to do is you need to develop an outline so this outline is going to give you a basic structure of the sop so how will you do that you will break it into three parts first is the introduction and what do we write in the introduction we start with an attention grabbing hook so what is the hook hook is basically something that grabs as i said attention grabbing hook hook is something basically that immediately grabs your attention so in the first paragraph of our sop we write that paragraph in the form of a story we share our motivation to study in in the program and we write it in the form of a story that immediately gets the attention of the admissions committee so when i was actually conducting this workshop last year in march 2021 and i was sharing with my students that see these are the different examples or this is how you can write a hook one of my students he wrote such a beautiful uh, hook that i was super impressed and i was super inspired by that so i just want to share that with you i'll speak it verbally because i don't have his sop right now so he uh, this was a student who uh, wanted to pursue an aerospace program abroad okay so he writes his uh, he opens his sop saying that he is actually the son of a professor and most of his life he has spent on a university campus and during his childhood his father actually used to take him to the observatory and he used to observe all the stars and the craters and the moon through the telescope and then he shares that he he also talks about how inspired he was by kalpana chavla and then he says that while i mean when you're a child right everybody wants to be an astronaut correct so he says that while all his uh, all his batchmates all his uh, uh, all his friends they have found new uh they found new ambitions for themselves when they were small they everybody wanted to become an astronaut but while everybody has now found new career choices for themselves he still wants to become an astronaut and he says that once uh, in his childhood when his mom got him those glow in the dark stickers that we generally that most people stick on their ceiling right with the stars and the moon everything he actually stuck them around the walls and he says that the reason i did that was i did not want to be beneath the stars and the moon i actually want to be among them so it was written so beautifully and i mean the moment somebody reads something like this it is so different it immediately captures your attention and the moment you read somebody who's so so motivated to pursue the program i'll be like please take please take this degree i mean please take admission right no matter what your uh, qualifications are somebody who's so so interested in doing this so that's the kind of sop that really stands out from other people next after the introduction coming to the body 
So here you are supposed to share the professional accomplishments and experiences. So everything you've done in your career, uh, in terms of some of the courses you've attended in college, some of the internships you've done, research projects that you worked on, any competitions, hackathons, etc., you've taken part in. All these things you can mention in the body of your SOP to again convince the admissions committee that you are well prepared to uh, to face any challenges that you see in the program. But one thing you need to remember here is that don't make it a rehash of a resume. What most people do is that they just explain everything that is there in a resume. That in this particular research project, these were some of the technical details of the project. This is what I did in the project. I was successful in publishing a research paper in the project. Then coming to work experience, this was my day-to-day -day responsibilities in the work. Please don't express it like that. Remember, the NSOP is about you. It's not about your work. It's not about the research project you've done. So instead of just talking about the technical details of the research project, share with the admissions committee what were some of the challenges that you faced? What were some of the roadblocks that you faced while doing that research project? How did you overcome them? These are the kind of things the admission committee wants to know. They want to see that if you were able to overcome those kind of challenges, then when we give you admission, you will be able to succeed very well in our program as well. So make it more personal instead of just making it like a detailed version of a resume. And then finally, you need to have the conclusion section. And here you need to explain how it's a win-win for both you and the university. So you need to reiterate to the admissions committee that based on all the experiences that you have shared till now, you are well prepared. And secondly, not only are you going to gain a lot from the university, but at the same time, you are going to contribute to their research, you're going to participate in class discussions, and that way you will also be giving back to the university. So you want to show them that, see, by giving admission to me, you will also get something in return. So this is the kind of, uh, this is the way in which you are supposed to close your SOP. So these are the three main sections, all right? So now that we're done with step two, Coming to the third part, which is writing the first draft. So once you have the brainstorm content, once you have your outline, you need to combine both these together to start to prepare your first draft. <laughs> Here, you need to tell a story and tie together your entire application. And don't worry at this stage about grammar, language, just keep on writing. Whatever you think can go in your SOP, just keep on writing without worrying about grammar and language, etc. Then once your first draft is ready, you move to the next stage where you edit and finalize your SOP. Here, you start editing your SOP in terms of the amount of information you've written, whichever is important you keep, whichever is not so important you remove it. You start tailoring your SOP based on different universities. Sometimes what we do is that we create one, uh, one SOP and we send it out to all universities. Don't do that. Look at the different university requirements, tailor your, your, tailor your SOP accordingly. Ensure, yeah, as I said, ensure you have included the university requirements. Then proofread for spelling, grammar, punctuation, and ensure that there is proper flow in your SOP. Information is flowing very smoothly from one section to another. And then once you've done this, and once you're very happy with the final outcome, share it with at least three people. They could be your friends, they could be your colleagues, seniors, professionals, and ask them to review your SOP. And then based on the feedback that you receive, again, keep changing your SOP until you have that one final document which is ready for submission. So as you can see, this is not a simple process. If you start writing your SOP five days before, you will definitely not be able to produce a good one. So to be able to write a very good SOP, you need to start off at least two to three months early. That way you have enough time to think about what are some of the things you would like to include and then write it. And obviously the feedback process also takes some time and you need to have enough time on your hands for that. Sometimes people come to me and they tell me that I have my deadline in another five days. Can you please help me write an SOP? And I tell them, listen, I can't help you because five days is very, very less to prepare a strong SOP. And I don't want to be involved in that, uh, in that uh, entire plan. <laughs> yeah. So is this clear, guys, how to write an SOP? Basic stuff, but is it clear? Yeah? Okay. So now moving on to the next part, which is, what is the difference between statement of purpose and a personal statement? So 
I'll tell you generally what happens when you are submitting your applications to universities, right? Most of them ask you for a statement of purpose. Sometimes instead of a statement of purpose, universities ask you for a personal statement. If that is the case, then statement of purpose and personal statements usually mean the same thing. But if universities are asking you for a statement of purpose and a personal statement, then these documents are going to be different. And we're going to talk about that. The first is the purpose. So the purpose of a statement of purpose is to show you as the right fit for the program based on your credentials and qualifications. So the, so the agenda of a statement of purpose is very clear that based on your qualifications, your experiences, we are constantly trying to sell yourself, sell you to the admissions committee and tell them that, see, you're the right fit for the program. On the other hand, a personal statement doesn't have a very clear agenda as such. Its, its main purpose is to showcase your personality and how you blend with the social and cultural environment of the university. And by social and cultural environment, I don't mean your race or ethnicity, but what are the kind of beliefs or the value systems that you are bringing to the university, which will help you in fitting with the student committee that is there. Next is the focus. So the focus of a statement of purpose is forward looking. How do you plan to equip yourself with the degree and achieve your career milestone? So in an SOP, we are constantly talking about that when I get this degree, this is what I plan to do. When I get this degree, these are my career goals, right? So it's forward looking. On the other hand, a personal statement is backward looking. It talks about your past experiences and how they have shaped you to become the person you are today. So in a personal statement, we talk about our past experiences anything which has left a mark on us and that has made us the person that we are today. So these are the things you focus on a personal statement. <clears throat> then coming to the content. So when it comes to content of an SOP, it has a very sharp focus. Everything in the SOP is targeted towards the degree or the program you are applying to. On the other hand, for a personal statement, it is much more general. You are free to share any instance that portrays you as a unique or a worthy candidate. It could be a volunteering program that you attended and that really taught you a lot of things and completely changed your career trajectory. Or it could be a person in your life, either your brother, sister, your teacher, your senior, somebody who has really motivated you or somebody who has really left a deep impact on you. Or it could be any experience any challenges you faced in your life in terms of probably an accident losing a family member um facing some health issues so all these things you can talk about in your personal statement and how that has changed you and shaped you to become the person that you are and finally some of the key features so the key features of a statement of purpose is the college education so these are the sections basically that you include which is college education work or internship experience, technical projects, research publications, reasons for backlogs, achievements, why you want to study in that university and program, and finally, what are your future goals? While on the other hand, for a personal statement, you talk about your cultural or financial background. So what kind of, what kind of upbringing are you coming from? What kind of culture are you coming from? You could probably be the first person to go to college from your family, or probably you come from a financial background where most of the people in your family were not able to go to college or study abroad and you're probably the first person to be doing that. What is the traditional attitude towards studies? Does your, do you come from a family which has always been very academic oriented or do you come from a family which were always into business and nobody was into academics and you are you know, slightly different from them? Why you value higher education and international exposure? So why studying abroad is so important to you? how unrelated experiences like volunteering have taught perseverance, love, and hope for humanity. So these are some of the things you can include in a personal statement. So I know all of this was a little theoretical. To make it slightly simpler for you, I actually have two examples here of a person who was applying to master's in public health in UC Berkeley. And the same volunteering experience, they've actually shared one in an SOP and another one in a personal statement. And you will see the kind of difference that is there in these two documents. The following year, I began research on Fulbright Fellowship in Brazil, studying the effects of the built environment on public health in Rio de Janeiro. I worked closely with the Center of Health Promotions, a Brazilian public health nonprofit, on developing the pilot youth building program in Brazil. 
We taught basic reading, writing, and math skills to 30 youth using the construction of a real community asset as a medium. I led the group in conducting evaluations of their built environment and its effect on their health. Through these evaluations, we mapped zones based on safety, access to healthy food, and transportation, and developed five, 10, and 20 year maps as future visions of the community. In the execution phase of their plan, the students had built handicapped access for two houses whose residents could not leave due to their disabilities. The students also retrofitted hazardous homes and began a campaign to lobby the city to install closed sewage lines in the community, which occurred in 2013. Seeing the in incredible obstacles these community leaders overcame despite minimal resources further inspired me to be a leader in my own community. So this is one paragraph coming to the next one. While studying architecture in college, I focused on working with the disadvantaged communities of Latin America. Through these transformative experiences, I realized where I needed to be and where I could make the biggest impact was in my own disadvantaged community, where I fully understood the context of local problems. While the American dream teaches us that all you have to do is to be successful is work hard, it isn't as simple for many people of color. There are so many structural barriers that make it difficult to access higher education, keeping us living in hazardous environments and fuel discrimination against us. It isn't, enough for, it, is, it isn't enough for me as an individual to overcome these barriers. I have to return to my roots to put the skills I've gained into practice, to make my community a more equitable place, a place where many others have access to opportunities that I have had. So by looking at the two paragraphs, can you guys actually tell me which one belongs to an SOP and which one belongs to a personal statement? Paragraph one belongs to what and paragraph two belongs to what? Any more answers? Yes, thank you. So clearly, right, paragraph one looks like an SOP. It's very, very technical, talks exactly what this person has done in their uh, volunteering program. While the second one is more personal, it talks about the person's beliefs and what does the person believe in, what are some of the issues or the barriers they have faced, right? So that's the major difference between when you're writing an SOP or a personal statement, all right? So guys, now coming to the last part that we have here for our agenda today, which is the deliverables of a course on writing your way to study abroad, which I'm going to conduct from next week onwards. It consists of a total of five sessions. It's going to happen from on weekends and Wednesdays from 2nd to 10th April. For those of you who wish to learn how to write an SOP, personal statement, LORs, emails to professors, and at the same time, get feedback on these documents and make them ready for submission. So some of the learning outcomes that you have is firstly, brainstorm, learn how to brainstorm content for SOPs for either MS programs, PhD programs, and even MBA programs. Learn to write the SOP with examples from top universities. So after speaking to over 10, 10 to 20 friends, I have combined all their SOPs together most of them gotten into some of the top universities in the world. And those kind of examples I'll be sharing with you as to what's the level that you need to maintain to be able to get admits. Then I'm also going to share, uh, I'm also going to share a lot of homework exercises and assignments with you for those of you who feel very nervous as to how are you going to do this. We're actually going to work with you together to make sure that you are able to write that SOP on your own. Then understanding what are personal statements and how to write them. So apart from SOPs, we will also learn what is the difference between personal statements and you especially need them when you are going for scholarships. So they are also like scholarship essays. So we're going to learn how you're supposed to write them. We will also learn how to write LORs. I'll share the complete format with you, share a lot of examples with you and same goes for writing emails to professors. So the total of two plans that I have guys, one is the standard plan, which comes with all these sessions where you will attend these sessions, learn how to write all these documents. You will get complete course material and also access to session recordings. But if you want to also receive feedback on your documents, that is where we have the premium plan. And in fact, you have one year feedback validity. So say, for example, you're attending the workshop now, but you want to get feedback later because you'll be writing your SOP later. You can also do that. And for you guys who are attending all these sessions, we have a promo. <coughs> we have a special discount for you as well that we've mentioned here. So if you want to go for the premium plan, you can avail the, avail the promo as well. Okay. So personally for me, 
the reason why i've actually started this workshop is if i share my own story with you is that when i was doing my undergrad i felt i did not have the right skills to be able to write such an important piece of document on my own because i'd never written academic essays before and so what i did was that i hired somebody who wrote sops for students and i asked him to write my sop in the end when i received it i felt that my sop was very impersonal it looked almost fake it did not showcase my skills my personality my qualifications in any way in fact whatever descriptions that i had written about my experiences qualifications only those things were included so it was an sop that could very well apply to anybody it was not tailored to me so in the end i decided to write the sop myself and that got me an admission into some of the top universities so the reason i'm doing this workshop is because i feel that nobody knows you better than yourself so only you can write the perfect sop for yourself nobody else can do that for you so here i am to provide you with that guidance if you need and uh, hopefully you'll be able to join all your dream universities so if you wish to know more about the course uh, my colleague akash has put the link in the chat box for you and now wish you guys all the very best go win your next career milestone i hope this session gave you some insights about what lies ahead of you and for those of you who wish to learn more about studying abroad i keep posting a lot of videos on youtube related to this so you can check them out later on and now i would also like to thank all the college committees today which have made the session possible from vmsit and it calicut and it warangal and svnit thank you so much and if you have any questions now please let me know and i'll clear those for you thank you i hope you all like the session yes so one question is does work experience matter yes obviously it's good to have relevant work experience and that strengthens your profile <coughs> when are the sessions okay so the workshop is starting on 2nd of april which is the next saturday and it goes all the way till next weekend that is uh, 10th of april sunday on the weekends we have the session at 11 in the morning and on wednesdays we have at 7 in the evening so that it doesn't disturb your college schedule um akash could you just put the link again in the chat box if students want to see am i a student no i'm not a student i'm a founder of wise up and this is something i do full time so uh, we do a lot of courses lot of workshops at wise up communication skills based courses apart from that i'm a part time youtuber uh i run my own youtube channel so all these things keep me busy ma'am is it wise to apply for a few universities in europe and top ones in usa yes you can do that i mean you can have a mix of universities from different countries based on your preference as well yeah so you can apply to some of the top universities in us and apart from that you can keep your options open and apply to some universities in germany canada as well that's great akanksh so akanksh is same currently pursuing my be in ai vertical at bmsit and plan to plan planning for higher studies that's great any other questions anything i can help you with youtube channel link yes uh, akash could you please help add that otherwise let me search for it can you tell if we can uh, thanks akash can you uh, can you tell if we can put our extra curricular achievements like dances sports in the sop yes i will strongly encourage you to put that because that adds some variety in your sop in fact for most people they don't have this cultural <coughs> aspect so if you're able to include that it really makes your sop different from other people ma'am okay how many months prior to admission should we start our preparation ideally april is the month to do that <laughs> in april may finalize your universities where you would like to study start with your gre topel prep finish it probably during your summer holidays your gre topel examinations in june start working on your documents from july onwards once you start working on your document by july august september get those things ready in october you can start sending out email to professors and by november obviously all the applications are open and then you can just submit everything so that's the ideal way to go about this 
Ma'am, should we give strong reasons for our switch of field? Yeah, absolutely. I think you need to clearly show why did you become interested in the other field? <laughs> so that clarity you need to give and obviously some relevant experience in the new field as well. Ma'am, please suggest how do we compare grading system or marks in the Indian education system with that of universities we are applying to? <clears throat> so um, I don't think personally you need to worry too much about their grading system. If universities really want you to convert your grades to their system, they will give you a <coughs> grading sort of a calculator where you can enter your CGP and then it gets changed to their own grading metrics. Um, having said that, um, it's obviously difficult for, from university to university to compare the CGPA, but with universities receiving so many applications from India, they have actually, they actually now have some calibration. Like say, for example, NITs and uh, IITs, you can't get a very high CGPA there, right? While on the other hand, private institutes, they're slightly more liberal and the CGPAs are very high. So that sort of calibration the universities now have and they evaluate you accordingly. Can we do it without writing TOEFL GRE? I mean, you can, if some, some countries don't have GRE TOEFL requirements, then in those cases, you can actually go without GRE TOEFL. Um, in Singapore, TOEFL is not compulsory and instead of GRE, you can actually give GATE as well. So you can check that out. Ma'am, is there any chance for UG and EC to non-tech field in abroad like masters in arts? Again, depends completely on your experiences and whether you're able to justify that. <clears throat> That's a fantastic question. So um, somebody is asking, my doubt is that should I consider joining the university immediately after my BE degree or work here and then apply for university abroad? <laughs> so the choice is yours actually at the end of the day. Personally, what I did was I immediately finished my undergrad and then I went for my master's. The disadvantages of that was that when you don't have enough industry experience, you don't exactly know where your interest lies in. And once I did my master's and I got into the industry, that is when I realized that I don't really enjoy this field. Imagine six years of education going into you realizing that you actually don't like it. So if you do take some work experience beforehand, how it helps you is that you have much clearer picture of which masters would you like to do, which program would you like to go ahead in. Secondly, if you get experience as well uh, beforehand, then it's easier to get internships and jobs later on. But for me, the advantage was that because I completed my education together, I started my work in a foreign country. And so the money that I was making was good right from the beginning. So that was the difference. Yeah. Okay, one or two final questions, guys. Ma'am, are there any entrance exams for PhD admissions? Not, a, not in abroad, as far as my knowledge goes. Ma'am, please comment on Duolingo test as a replacement for IELTS or TOEFL. I'm sorry, I don't have much information on Duolingo test. Sorry, don't know. <clears throat> okay. All right. So thank you so much, guys. Thanks for your participation. And I wish you all the very best. Okay, we can stay in touch. You can text me on LinkedIn, Instagram and uh, we can have a chat if you have any other doubts or anything. Yeah. Thank you so much. Bye. Take care. Thank you. Bye.